Good morning. morning. Welcome to First Congregational Church of Shrewsbury on this Palm Sunday morning. We're so glad to see so many people. We can see the vaccines are rolling out because we don't think there would be as many of you if it was not the case. And we're just very glad you're here. Unfortunately, we couldn't have an outdoor service today due to weather, but we are here together this morning. We have the chimers this morning. The children's bell choir is here, and also an ensemble from the Worcester Youth Orchestra, founded in 1947. They will be playing in the back our uh, prelude, and I think our postlude. I'm not sure if they're playing something in the middle, but no, two pieces, and so you'll be hearing them from the rear. Um, so welcome, and we have announcements and a welcome from the deacons. Good morning, my name is Linda Phillips, and we welcome you on behalf of the deacons to this very special Palm Sunday. It's so nice to see so many people here today. Um, a couple quick announcements. Um, a very special thank you to everyone who attended and donated to the virtual IHN Evening of Hope. Uh, this past Thursday, the event was a great success, and we want to thank everyone who supported um, this for the IHN of Worcester. Uh, also, the, there are many slots that are available for the vigil. Um, they are signed up from April 1st, 9 p.m. until 10 a.m. April 2nd, which is in the church. You can go online and sign up. Um, you'll be here by yourself or with someone that you can bring with you. And if you have any questions, please see Deb Daudato or myself after church, and uh, we can assist you with that. Thank you, and we welcome to you this service. Thanks very much. Um, normally, we would greet one another. Um, we, haven't been, we haven't done that in a year in the customary way. However, and normally we don't use cell phones in church, especially when they make noise. But we're going to do a virtual passing of the peace. If you have a cell phone, turned to silent. Um, greet someone you love who is not here electronically. Say, peace be with you, or whatever you'd like, and that you're at first church, and you want to extend God's peace to them. I bet there's someone you could do that to. Some of you did it. I saw this in another church and I thought it was kind of cool. So take your palms, dear people of God, hold them up, and join me in our. Oh, no. Well, actually, no, we'll do the prelude right after. Hold on, Worcester Youth Orchestra. Hold your palms up, and join me in the call to worship. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Jerusalem. Shout aloud, O daughters of Zion. Behold, your king comes to you. Humble and bright and Holy God, we remember that our Lord Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem as Messiah, but also to suffer and to die. Let these palms be for us signs of his victory, and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our sovereign and follow the gospel way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. And now, the Worcester Youth Orchestra Ensemble would lead us in our opening music. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Um, will you join and will you stand in the singing of our opening hymn, number 55 of the New Century Hymnal, Rejoice So Pure in Heart. Join me in our unison prayer of confession. Lord Jesus, you rode a donkey and came in peace, humbled yourself and gave yourself for us. We confess our lack of humility. As you entered Jerusalem, the crowd shouted, Hosanna, save us now. On Good Friday, they shouted, crucify. We confess our praise is often empty. We sing Hosanna, but cry crucify. As the crowds laid their palms in front of you, you walked the path of a servant. You took no glory for yourself. We confess that we want to be accepted and take the easy way. We do not stay true to your will. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to follow in the way of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Beloved, trust and believe that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Hosanna in the highest. Now and ever shall. 
time with children now, and there are definitely some. Thank you for playing. And are there any others here that would like to come forward besides those already here? All right. So today is Palm Sunday. You can see that these are indeed palms. Why do you, why why is it Palm Sunday? Why why what are these for? Other than the fact that they're palms. What, why do we do this? Anyone know? No? So Jesus enters Jerusalem. And the people think maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the one who will restore the kingdom of Israel, overthrow the Roman occupiers, liberate us, and bring peace and prosperity. Maybe he's the one. And so the common people, not the rich people, not the wealthy people, not the chief priests and the kings and nobility or the Romans for sure, but just the ordinary people did what they could for their supposed king. So they put their cloaks before his donkey who, that he was riding on and they threw palm branches down before him and waved them and shouted Hosanna, which was a greeting to a king, which means God is salvation. In other words, salvation is upon us. There's a king. Rejoice. And so they were sort of waving these as Jesus came in to Jerusalem through the gates. But it was actually, it wasn't sort of a grand royal entry. It was actually very humble. Kings don't ride on donkeys, right? They ride on chariots or carriages. Um, but this was a humble ceremony for a humble king by the ordinary, by the poor people of the day. And that is why we have Palm Sunday. And now you know. Are you glad you know? Are you glad you know that's why we do this? So that's my children's moment for today. Happy Palm Sunday. Thanks for coming forward. The scripture reading today, the first, is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every kneel should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So ends the first reading. The second reading is Mark 11, 1 through 11 and 14 through 9. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find there tied a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. And if it, anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and then they allowed them to take it. 
Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon, the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with alabaster jar, a very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money could have been given to the poor. And they scolded her, but Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me, for you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. So ends the reading.
Now that felt like Easter, didn't it? That's, it's been a long time since we've gathered this way with increasing numbers, since we have more confidence as vaccines roll out, since we have had a little glimmer <clears throat> of Easter joy. So as we begin Holy Week, um, hold that, hold that in your hearts. I think that's really important. We are exhausted after a year of pandemic and mask wearing and social distance. We all know the story of Palm Sunday, those of us who frequent churches. Jesus is entering Jerusalem and he knows his days are numbered. Traditionally, this is called the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it's thought to echo the prophecy of Zechariah, behold, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It suggests that Jesus was declaring he is king of Israel to the anger of the Sanhedrin, the council of the Kohanim, the priests of the temple. But this entry is not, I think, what most of us think as royal. As I said in the time with children, kings don't ride on donkeys. They ride on the finest horses, or better yet, they are seated in a splendid chariot or, ca or carried in a pulled carriage by soldiers. Yet Jesus rides on a colt, a symbol of humility. There may have been people hoping he was indeed the Messiah that they wanted, the one that would overthrow the Romans, restore the kingdom, usher in peace, prosperity, the messianic age. They throw down their cloaks and palm branches before him. And yet the sweetness of this event is always tempered by its bitterness. Jesus is riding not to a palace, but to Calvary, not to a throne, but to a cross. He knows this, right? Even if his disciples do not. The second part of the story of Mark's gospel describes a woman who anoints Jesus' head with expensive ointment worth 300 denarii, a year's wages, in a moment. This is one of the few stories that is recorded in all four Gospels. The woman is usually identified as Mary Magdalene. And this anointing is extravagant. The disciples are displeased. This money could surely be used for better purposes. It could be used for the poor. And yet Jesus defends her and says that she is preparing him for his burial, which probably perplexed and frightened the disciples. He concludes with striking words that the story of his anointing by Mary Magdalene will be told wherever the gospel is preached in memory of her. Nowhere else does Jesus command that someone be remembered, with the one exception of himself at the Last Supper. The custom of the Jews at the time of Jesus was to anoint the dead. In fact, the resurrection story records that three women disciples, including Mary Magdalene, went to the tomb of Jesus to anoint him with myrrh and spices on the first day of the week as he had been quickly buried to avoid profaning the Sabbath day. It is here that they find the tomb empty. So again, the story is bittersweet, an anointing, but one for an impending death. What I find most interesting about the Palm Sunday story is how the things of heaven are portrayed in earthly ways. The heavenly king rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. He's greeted by the common people in a gritty ceremony. There are no trumpets, no fanfares, no velvets and silks, no jewels and soldiers or the trappings of power. In fact, his triumphal entry is so humble and devoid of grandeur that it's hard to know what to make of it. Whether we deem this person 
as God, the Word incarnate, or a spirit-filled prophet, or simply a heroic human being, we know the next events. They are not royal at all. They are, in fact, tragic. But it is a meeting of the heavenly with the earthly. The Son of God is with the common people. He is their king, and he is not interested in nobility or the imperial majesty of Rome. So I have three stories for you this morning about the heavenly in the earthly. The first one, and as some of you know, I worked in overseas development, and I've been privileged to travel to many countries, many of them very poor. The first one is the Cook Islands in the South Pacific on the island of Aitutaki. And I went out on a boat with a fisherman um, at night to do night fishing in the lagoon, which is something that's quite common. And so this old man took me on his small boat and we went out into the middle of the lagoon and fished. And it was peaceful, it was still, and the stars were abundant because there is no pollution, there is no noise, there is no light pollution. You can see stars that you would never see. It was a heavenly experience, even just that. And I looked around and I saw three orbs of light floating, it would seem, over the lagoon. And I, I turned to the man and I said, what's that? What's that? What are those lights? They looked like UFOs. What are they? And he looked up very calmly. And he was like, it's nothing. I said, what do you mean it's nothing? It looks like something to me. And he said, it's the spirit of the ancestors crossing from one island to the other. It happens all the time. Doesn't it happen where you're from? No. No, that doesn't happen where I'm from. But this, this sort of the heavenly breaking in the earthly, for him, the heavenly was near. He was a poor fisherman. The heavenly was so close. Well, to me, relatively speaking, a very rich man, it was so far. Second story, in Sierra Leone, in West Africa, Originally a British colony founded for freed slaves, similar to the American colony of Liberia. I was assigned there by Christian Aid in London, and so I worked there a few times. And was, as is typical, I was sent to a church to preach a sermon. And this was a Baptist church that was English speaking. Most people speak Creole, which is a patois that is not fully intelligible. Um, to standard English, but this congregation was English speaking. So I went there um, for the worship service and I met the minister, um, an older man, and he had just put down the phone in his office and he looked up and he said, uh, I've lost my granddaughter today to malaria. Uh, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, do you, do you need to go? Do you need to do you want me to do something? What, what can I do? And he said, oh no, of course not. I will, I will, of course, conduct the service. And he did, with joy, as if nothing had happened. Because death was every day in Sierra Leone. People expected to lose children to disease in childhood. And for him, this was tragic, but it was normal, while to me it was horrific because for us in this world it is rare for this to happen, but for him all too common. The congregation was full of people who had suffered the ravages of the Sierra Leone Civil War. Some of you may have seen the film Blood Diamonds which only barely describes what happened there. Most people have lost people in the carnage, in their families, their lives turned upside down. All of them had a story. And as I saw the Baptist minister rejoice with his congregation in spite of the loss, it was a moment 
of the heavenly breaking into the earthly. How could he still rejoice? I don't know if I could. I don't think I would even have been there. And yet he did because he had done this so many times. This was not the first loved one he had lost. My last story is from Livingston in the southern province of Zambia on the Zambezi River near Victoria Falls. I was sent into a chiefdom. There are 72 chiefdoms in Zambia. They don't have any legal status, but they have customary status. And this was the chiefdom of Chief Mukuni. And I was meeting the elders in the kraal. And there were three children swinging on a swing set just off to, off to my left. And they were both saying to each other, we swing higher and higher in the name of Jesus. What? Like, and I was just like, and then the other girl said, praise Jesus, we are swinging higher. And then the other boy was like, praise God, praise Jesus, let's go higher, higher, higher in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, there is more joy in this poverty than anything I've ever seen in the wealth of the developed world where I live. They were content. They were rejoicing in their swing set and somehow made it a religious devotion. They were like little kids, four years old. Church is everything in Zambia. It is overwhelmingly Christian. In fact, it's constitutionally a Christian country, but with no denomination as the state church. They're all equal. And it's the community center. It's the place where people go. Everyone goes to church in Zambia. It's the social event every week. Everyone sings. Um, everyone rejoices, even in the midst of poverty and want. And it was, again, this breaking in of the heavenly into the earthly for me. So as one who's been privileged to travel, I've seen the great marvels of architecture in the world, the great sites in different countries, the cathedrals of Christendom, and the awesome beauty that is natural on our planet, such as Victoria Falls, the largest waterfall in the world by some estimates. But I've increasingly noticed as I grow older that I no longer can locate divinity in the things that I once did. I don't find it as beautiful as they are in cathedrals. If I'm in Notre Dame in Paris, which I've been several times before the fire, um, it's no longer where I would enjoy it. But it wouldn't be where I'd find the heavenly necessarily. Where I find it, it seems, has often been on the margins, often in poverty, in these earthen vessels called human beings. That's where I'm finding my heavenly. And that is who, to whom Jesus comes in his entry into Jerusalem. He is their king indeed. And it is to them that he gives the kingdom. In a very real way, their lives mirror his. In our lives, and by the standards of world poverty, all of us are very wealthy, even if we are not wealthy by US standards. We, our lives do not. Jesus is born into poverty, not into wealth. Their vulnerability to life's moments of crucifixion is all too frequent. I just gave you two examples of people being crucified by the vagaries of life. It is perhaps no wonder that Christianity is so strong in the poorest parts of the world. For their king will ascend a cross and die with them. Yet he promises resurrection and victory over the world and the gift of eternal life to these, his own. And what is this gift of eternal life anyway? We don't know. 
other than it is an infinite good. As Paul the Apostle wrote, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. That is what this king brings to his own. It is impossible for linear, finite beings like us to fully comprehend what eternal life could mean. Yet, strangely, this idea is perhaps most real to the poor, the promise of perfect, unending life, which is not what they have. They have no perfection, and they certainly do not have unending life. We, in our own wealthy material context, may be tempted to dismiss this idea of eternal life, this gift of this king riding on a donkey before the poor, as wishful, unscientific, or quaint. But we should not. We should be open to the inbreaking of the heavenly into the earthly and welcome this humble king as our own. Amen. Friends, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose dear Son went not up to joy, but first suffered pain, and did not enter into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of his cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I ask your prayers this morning for those who have asked them. For Nolan, Bonnie, Bill, Donald, and Trudy. For J. Dev, Anna, Linda, Charles, Sandy, Donna, Bo, Warren, John, Sandy, Barbara, Ray, Dot, Danny, Lisa, Kiara, Alex, Rena, Jean, Janet, Barbara, Ray, Cam and for Bill being treated for cancer, and for all military personnel, first responders, health care workers, and all who protect and care for us. I ask your prayers for the world. We lift in prayer the families of the shooting victims in Georgia and Colorado who were so violently murdered. We ask God's blessing upon all those who are victims of violence, especially violence at the end of a gun. We lift up the Asian American community in the wave of violence that is confronting them, and we say that indeed Asian lives matter to us and to God. We pray for those in Myanmar, Burma, for hundreds of Burmese citizens, including Government officials, civilians, even police officers are fleeing violence due to last month's military coup. We pray for our siblings in Brazil, where hospitals are near collapse as COVID-19 overwhelms their infrastructure. We ask for God's presence in India that is seeing a significant increase in infections in one of the most populous countries on the planet. And we pray for the peoples of Somalia, where there is a COVID-19 surge there in a country that can least afford it. We pray for our sisters and brothers in Australia, where natural disasters due to heavy rains have spread across the country, causing evacuations. Are there other prayers and concerns that you have this morning that you want to share with the congregation? Uh, for the people of Alabama, 
how we can rebuild after the tornado? For the people of Alabama, after the terrible tornado outside Birmingham, um, and the lives lost and the properties destroyed. Thank you, Dylan. Are there others? Yes. For my uncle Bob in Scarborough, Maine, who was fighting pancreatic stage four pancreatic. For Bob um, in Scarborough, Maine, who's battling stage four pancreatic cancer, God have mercy on Bob and be with him. Are there others? Any joys this morning? Birthdays, anniversaries, happy events, successes, triumphs, triumphal entries. Yes? For our son Andrew, who will be turning 30. For Andrew, who's turning 30. Happy birthday, Andrew. I think we should sing happy birthday. <laughs> Ready? Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Andrew. Happy birthday to you. Now, you thought it was embarrassing when that happened at a restaurant? And they, they bring the cake in, and then like the staff start doing this tacky happy birthday. It's so much worse now. <laughs> it's on tape. I mean, other joys this morning. Yes. Dave Russell, who had a birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, Dave Russell. Have any others? Linda and I are this week. <laughs> Two more birthdays. Hooray! Linda and Sue. Excellent. Well, happy birthday to all those, those who are too shy or afraid to share their event. And of course, the cel one celebration is we have not had church like this in over a year. This is the first time it's felt a little bit like it used to be. That is a joy worth praising God for. So we gather all of our prayers and all of our joys and we give thanks for them and we lift them up in the name of our crucified and risen Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray with these words, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are grateful for all that you give to this church in your time and in your treasure. Um, our church has only, um, has barely had a dent from COVID, 97% rate of giving, and we are in the black. This is amazing. I mean, some churches have had a 75% reduction in giving during COVID because of job losses, because of stress, because of whatever, but this church has kept going. Um, your giving of time as well as treasure has been consistent throughout we have been active, and I am just so thankful that you have kept us going. So as we give thanks to God for the gifts God has given us, Curtis will lead us in the offertory. Oh, I'm sorry, Worcester Youth Orchestra. The Worcester Youth Orchestra will lead us in the offertory.
us pray together. Lord Jesus, entering Jerusalem in triumph, yet heading for Calvary and losing our lives, we find them in you. In sharing our treasure and time, we receive the blessings of your kingdom. May these gifts be useful in your holy work of peace, justice, and service in the world. Amen. Now, my friends, go forth into the world in peace and embrace this holy week as children of God as we approach the joy of Easter. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the giver of life be upon you and all those whom you love this day and forever. Amen.